Hello there friends, my name is Rachel GNS Middle, Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name and my middle name is my last name and I am here today on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them and today we are getting into one of our best of best end lists and this one is which opera has the best dialogue? And what I've done is I have ranked every single dialogue scene in order. I pretty much just laid them all out and then picked the bottom from one list and the bottom from the other list and just did it instinctively. There were maybe one or two times when I thought, wait, I was super wrong to have that one low down and I moved it up. Typically that I would know that was the case if like there was one list that I just kept avoiding. <laughs> like forever and ever. That actually happened with Iolanthe, I think, in this case. I realised, oh, you know what, maybe that one shouldn't have been at the bottom because I'm just, I've just been ignoring it for the first, like, hundred items on the list. So, occasionally I realised I was wrong a few videos ago and I changed things, but largely I kept it the same. 98% I've kept the same. Once I'd put all the dialogue scenes in order, I then gave each one a grade from 178 to one, and then I added up all the grades that each opera got, and then I took the average of that. There are 13 operas on this list because Trial by Jury has no dialogue, and number 13 is Thespis. I actually quite like the dialogue in Thespis. I actually haven't filmed myself doing the dialogue in that one yet. I am definitely going to at some point because I think it would be really fun. But the dialogue in Thespis is not largely very emotional or funny or necessarily informing the audience about the characters, maybe with the exception of a couple of the scenes that involve Thespis. There's one scene that did quite decently that got 117 points and that one was the picnic scene. I think that is a really really fun scene. It's great in the sense that it involves so many characters who were each individually given a character and you can really tell who those individuals are even just by seeing them for one minute. And it's a shame that these characters don't really do much. I think Tipsian does have a couple of lines in the court scene, but it's a shame that you don't see some of these characters again, because this scene is just so full of life and character. It's a shame that the rest of Thespis is not like this, but that is a really great scene. The court scene also got 101 points. I think that one is also pretty fun, full of organised chaos. So there are a couple of good scenes in Thespis, but most of them are not terribly funny or inform you much about the characters or have much dramatic value or even really typically good poetry, um, clever use of language. We just don't really see that in Thespis, sadly. Number 12 I have given to Princess Ida. Now this is written in iambic pentameter and some of it I think is extremely beautiful. There are some awesome turns of phrases, especially whenever Gama speaks. And there's actually one or two scenes I marked pretty highly with 125 points. We have another picnic scene. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> the two worst operas for dialogue both had a picnic scene as their best one. This is so good because you see Princess Ida and Hilarion get to know each other and you see that Hilarion's starting to fall for her and that interspersed with everything Cyril is saying and that progressively getting more tense, more chaotic and things just unravelling. So that I think is a really good scene. I also adore the speech that Hilarion gives to his father in I think it's scene two the one that ends with, but at that age, I had not yet learned to speak. So there are some really excellent moments in Princess Ida. Admittedly, I did mark a lot of it down because I just find it problematic and personally hate it. It's not, so it's not necessarily just poorly written or isn't good for poetry. But then surprisingly, even though a lot of it is written in iambic pentameter, the poetry in a lot of it really isn't too great. Ida, I just don't think has amazing poetry considering it is written in iambic pentameter but Gama's scenes like the scenes that are really heavy with Gama and some of the scenes with Hildebrand there's some really clever poetry in there I don't have my Bradley on me sadly right now but the line I see a touch to it Gama's arms and then his legs you know, that 
that scene where they're describing King Gama arriving, that's very well written. That's lovely. I think the most of the reasons I don't like the writing in Ida is because it's not really funny. The jokes in it are often unkind and just not even coming from truth. They're coming from stereotypes and I just don't really appreciate that. But it has had a couple of scenes that have done well, but I hope that most of us will agree really that the dialogue in Ida isn't really something to write home about. Number 11 I have given to Utopia Limited. And again, I, I want to say that I am the first person to say, hey, I actually really like the dialogue in Utopia Limited. So much so that I am surprised that this did come below the two above it. Possibly the reason it's come so low is that even though there are some good scenes in Utopia Limited, and I think the writing is really good, the trouble is that it's not terribly funny. I don't think it is extremely focused in getting across the narrative in the way some of these other operas are, even in ones where I thought maybe the individual scenes weren't as good. So with Utopia Limited, there's some individual jokes that are really fun and it does a really good job with character. I think that's something that I noticed in particular like with King Paramount and Scafio and Fantis. Their scenes in the first half are fantastic. However, we do have these scenes in the second half that I find weak. I don't find focused. I don't know if Gilbert really knew what he was doing here. I'm going to get into this in a later video more, but I feel that Utopia Limited actually has one of the best, if not the best, concepts out of all the operas, but its execution just is not terribly good. Gilbert had a great idea, but then was lazy in following through with it. So the punchline at the end with the government by party is great. The trouble is getting there is very confusing. It means that we're left puzzled as to what utopia was like before these people came because it was a utopia. All the people were really, really happy, but then we learn that there was sickness and there was war and there was, like, what, what was, what's going on here? It's just, it's confused. In, a, in an attempt to produce good satire, Gilbert forgot the story. He didn't really know what he was focusing on. So great concept, but essentially like a lot of the dialogue is just a bit unfocused. There are a couple of scenes though, in fact, four scenes that did very well. The one before the quartet was Scafio's Awakening. I think that is a wonderful scene. One, three, seven points. We have the king with Scafio and Fantis. That's before first you're born. That's when the king is, is, is trying to say to Scafio and Fantis, I don't really understand um, wh why this is supposed to be funny, that I'm writing this terrible stuff about me. Can you help me understand? They're like, oh yeah, well, that's why. It's, it's so that your subjects can be terrorized by you during the day, then they can laugh at you at night. Isn't that great? And he's like, oh yeah. Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. And you can just see how insecure and manipulated this guy is. And I think it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful character study. But that's just an absolutely cracking scene. Oh, also I missed one. The pre act two finale was Zara's speech, which I alluded to earlier. That's a fantastic scene. And then with 140 points, the scene with Zara and the King. This is when King Paramount breaks down. And then Zara just goes into this absolutely deranged very eloquent speech, which if she wasn't planning, she just has a really quick brain. Like Zara is so fiercely clever, <laughs> like cleverer than all the other characters in the opera. She just, she's just there. She just has a solution. Go and check out my Utopia Limited dialogue video. So yeah, I do love the Utopia Limited dialogue, but it came low down the list because it is part of an unfocused story and that does sadly get across in the dialogue. Number 10, I have given to The Gondoliers. I am slightly surprised this one beat Utopia Limited, but what you can't ignore about The Gondoliers dialogue is that even though a lot of it is quite frivolous and doesn't concentrate a lot on character, so you are left kind of thinking, oh, who are these people? <laughs> what are their motivations? You also do just get this sense of utter joy from every scene. That I'm thinking of the pre cachucha scene, I'm actually not sure how that did. I think it was quite middle of the pack overall. But just the sheer joy in that gear change. Oh, well, what do we do until Nurse, <laughs> nurse turns up? <laughs> Let's have a dance. <laughs> you know, just, just, 
it's nuts. We have had two scenes that got over 140 points. We have, with 145 points, the Quartet and Don Al Act 1. And then with 151 points, we have the Quartet and Don Al in Act 2. So both of those scenes. And also, this one must have done really well as well. Yeah, 121 points is Don Al with just the two guys. With the whole leapfrogging lords situation. But both of those scenes that Don Al has with the quartet, <laughs> they are absolute gold. It's so funny when the villain is just rendered ineffectual by the sheer stupidity and blitheness of the other people in the scenes. So Don Al is kind of a villain in this story. Like his motivations are kind of at odds with the quartet because their motivations are basically they want to be together and they want to both be kings and queens and it'll be really, really fun and they're really excited and happy. But he wants to get them there under false pretenses so he can marry one of them off to Casilda. So he knows that neither of them are going to be a queen. So he lies to them. So he's not really a villain in like the generic sense of the word, but in the GNS sense, he is a villain. But he is just, as I say, rendered totally ineffectual and impotent by... Giuseppe and Marco's absolute joy and just infectious enthusiasm about what they believe the situation to be. And Giuseppe's line, not even a Lord High Cook. <laughs> I hadn't really realised how funny this was when I directed it. It's I like, almost want to direct it again, just because it's just absolutely hysterical. Like, they're just really stupid. And <laughs> the idea of Giuseppe just going, wait, not even a Lord High Cook. And that just making Don Al... <gasps> it's like his head just explode with rage. <laughs> As I say, I think what brought Gondoliers above Utopia is just its sheer infectious joy and happiness that it gets across in every scene. There may be some, a couple of duds, like when Casilda and the Duke and Duchess are talking. I don't really think that's too much to write home about, to be honest. But... Everything involving the quarter, everything involving Donnell, absolutely wonderful. Number nine, I have given to the Yeoman of the Guard. Now, this is an opera that has some really not too good scenes in it at all, but it is made up for and the average is brought up by the fact that it's, it's got some utterly stunning scenes. So, yeah, just for context, it, do, it does have like a couple of really really quite daft scenes in it. The one before Strange Adventure, I think, is one of the stupidest scenes that Gilbert has ever written. It is so rushed and unfocused and it just dumps a whole load of information on you that it kind of makes the audience feel a bit tricked because Meryl and Carruthers suddenly are in this situation which has never been alluded to before. It's put the director and I'm going to be directing Yeoman of the Guard next year, so you can check that out. I'll tell you more about that in a future video. But it puts the director in an impossible situation. And the actor's like, how on earth do you play this scene? If anyone has any advice to me about this scene, I mean, I guess I'll talk to the actors about it. I've got several months to uh, rehearse this one, so I've a bit more time than the five days I had the last time I directed Yeoman. My goodness. But then, check out these scenes that did really well. There are five scenes that got over 140. At 147, we have Phoebe and Wilfred's first scene. At 148, we have the Fairfax and Elsie scene, where they're kind of getting to know each other, and I happen to think are genuinely falling in love. You don't have to agree with me. People are allowed to think that Fairfax is awful. You are allowed to think that and you're allowed to play it that way. It's completely consistent with the text. However, what is also consistent with the text is that he, you know, maybe he's a little awkward and and not so used to socialising with people, especially women. But generally, he's a nice, well-intentioned person. And I think that this scene could be very sweet if done in a sweet way. <laughs> And also we have, with 153 points, Phoebe and Wilfred's second scene. That's the pre-Were I Thy Bride scene. Then with 157 points, we have the third Phoebe and Wilfred scene. So yeah, Phoebe and Wilfred, they have some cracking dialogue. I'd say I actually haven't done this 
there's no list anywhere. But if we're ranking which characters have the best dialogue, then I'd say Phoebe and Wilfred just win that. <laughs> Despard has some pretty good dialogue too. Despard, Margaret, Rose Robin, I mean, ev everyone from Rudigore, basically. But everyone from Rudigore, Phoebe, Wilfred, Tenor and Patagai from Mikado. I mean, they have such good dialogue. But th these guys, ooh, yes. And then finally, with 164 points. So that is coming in 15th place overall. So I love this scene and it didn't even get into the top 10. We just had such brilliant scenes above it. But that's the scene with Jack Point and Wilfred at the start of the second act. Absolutely adore this scene. Jack Point's beginning of his, or oh, some could say the, the peak really of his breakdown or or however you want to play it i mean again it's really open to interpretation and that's kind of why yeoman's so good because you can go to different performances of yeoman and they will be completely different with total totally different interpretations of characters and that is what i like to see i don't like to go and see identical shows i like to go to a show and say, oh that's different i've never seen them played like that before oh i'm interested you know that's, that's cool. I, I like it. I mean, don't do different for the sake of different. I mean, obviously, like, read the text and base it on the text. But, hey, it, it's good to be different. But this scene, Jack's unhinged speech with Wilfred just there next to him, followed by... I think a jester's calling would suit me to a hair. It's just so... He's so oblivious, but also so sweet and friendly. Love Wilfred. Love Jack Point. This is such a cracking scene because these are such these are two such great characters that are set up in Act One as being amazing characters, and then we actually get to see them together doing their thing, and that is just great. Number eight, we have HMS Pinafore. Now, I actually think that Pinafore's dialogue is pretty good. I th I think it's overall better than Yeoman's dialogue. I think that. There's only one scene that actually beat that top scene in The Yeoman of the Guard, and that is the scene with Josephine and Rafe. And that came number 11 in the entire list. This scene, I do think, potentially contains my favourite Gilbert and Sullivan line, which is Rafe's speech to Josephine. I am poor in the essence of happiness, lady. Rich only in never-ending unrest. In me there meet a combination of antithetical elements which are at eternal war with one another. Driven hither by objective influences, thither by subjective emotions, wafted one moment into blazing day by mocking hope, plunged the next into the Cimmerian darkness of tangible despair. I am but a living ganglion of irreconcilable antagonisms. I hope I make myself clear, lady. To me, that is my favourite line. <laughs> in the GNS operas. It's just so indicative of Gilbert's humour. And that to me is a genuine, total earnestness. But at the same time, from a character who is, who is utterly ridiculous. So Gilbert has created these characters that have such big feelings. I think that's why I empathise with them so much, because I have very big feelings. When I see a lot of people playing these characters, they, they think that it's stupid because maybe they themselves don't have the depths of feelings that I do. But I also have a medical disorder that means my feelings are too much. So this is not me criticising people. <laughs> I am pointing out that actually happening to have a disorder, which means I experience emotions more profoundly, can actually help me in acting, but it also makes other areas of my life extremely difficult. <laughs> because what is the point of being a very good actor if you appear unhinged at auditions? That is that that is the issue that I often have. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think that I'm going to be a lot of drama when actually I just work really hard and get on with my job, really. But we have these characters who are so unbelievably earnest, but I just buy it. I completely buy that he'd be saying that. But the thing is, he does ask it, like, I hope I make myself clear, lady, because he's aware that he's being quite complicated. To me, it is just, it's the least natural you could possibly speak. But if you deliver it, 
in a very matter of fact, natural way. That is just to me the absolute funniest thing in the world. This scene is just a roller coaster of emotions. I absolutely love this. Along with the bullying of Dick Deadeye and just like the general themes that are just so intricately woven through this opera. There's only one scene that did badly in this opera, and that's the one that's Captain Josephine and Joseph. And that's, I think, just because it's so short. And then we get a handful of scenes that did like, meh, you know, kind of okay. But yeah, we have that Rafe Josephine scene at the top. We also have, with 134 points, we get Sir Joseph, Captain Rafe and Boats. And that's when Sir Joseph arrives and gets them all to line up and gets these splendid seamen to step forward. That is just comedy gold. We also have with 139 points, the Captain and Josephine scene, where you just get to learn what an amazing, soft, gentle, father he is yeah you get to see his temper later of course you do but you also see that he genuinely wants what's best for his daughter but he is also just a little bit brainwashed by society and does occasionally have these messed up priorities and then i've also given 141 points of the pre-trio scene boats and dick dead eye rafe where Rafe is suddenly just imbued with this amazing spirit from what Sir Joseph has said. True, I lack birth. You were birth on board this very ship. Yes, I had forgotten that. And it's, just, it's so silly and yet so earnest. It's just so full of revolutionary emotion and dramaticness. And even though I do think that Gilbert was writing this with like a little bit of tongue in cheek in a sense that these people are a bit deluded, like in a way he's the voice of Dick Deadeye who's saying, look, this isn't the way the world works, we can't do that. It's also just so cathartic and heartrending to hear people who were downtrodden talk in this way. And I get something from that. That's why Pinafore's so good because it's just an underdog story. It's a story about underdogs. And they're such loving, warm underdogs. And also the overdogs aren't even that nasty. They're just conflicted and have weird priorities, but they're actually not nasty at all. They're actually, again, really sweet people. And they all just need, they all just need to give their heads a bit of a wobble, as James O'Brien would say. Number seven I have given to The Sorcerer. This one was a little bit surprising for me when I first did the video on it. Again, this is another one that I need to actually film, but it really struck me like well, how good these scenes are. I was like, wow. It, and, and they're all kind of quite consistently good as well. The lowest marked one got 25 points and that one was Alexis and Aline in Act Two. And the only reason that is so short it's not because it contains anything that's bad. There's no bad writing in it. It's just the fact that there's so little of it. It's almost, it's almost like this is such a big moment for Aline to stand up to Alexis like this and refuse to obey one of his orders that I just wanted it to be given more weight and more time. So to me, it just feels a bit rushed. But that's my only issue with it. Also with 26 points, we had the pre-act two finale. There were some really funny jokes in there, but essentially it is just a bit confused as I keep repeating again and again. I don't like the fact that we are just openly acknowledging that all these people are going to be returned to their old loves. But if they had old loves in the first place, then why on earth did Alexis do any of this? Like it is just, it just betrays a lack of thoughtfulness on Gilbert's part. And anyone who tries to tell me, this is a comic opera, it's not supposed to make sense. Can you just not watch my videos? Like, can you just stop watching? Can you just like remove me as a friend and a person that you like? J just, just go away. I I'm not interested in you. These videos are not for you. So just go away. But then look at all these scenes that are done fantastically well. With 128 points, we have the Alexis Wells Aline intro. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Oh, good afternoon, sir. I believe you are a sorcerer. <laughs> it's just, yes, I have seen their advertisement. It's just so absurd the way these people are talking. And this is like a lot of why I think Gilbert might have been autistic. It's just, it's so wholesome in its simplicity. <laughs> 
the, the way these characters are talking to each other is just not it's, it's not like eloquent or thoughtful you, you, you can see how Gilbert gets better but there's something about this which is just so utterly charming and I just get such a kick out of it I absolutely love this scene 132 points goes to the Alexis and Marmaduke scene. I mean, again, the way these characters talk to each other just is not normal. People do not talk to each other like this. I am welling over with limpid joy <laughs> into the lucid lake of liquid love into which Aline and I are to drift for eternity. Marmaduke's like, uh. Ian Henderson delivered this like better than anyone has ever delivered it. I mean, I, I can't say that because I've not seen every sorcerer, but... Honestly, the way Ian Henderson delivered that line in in The Sorcerer that I was playing Constance in, this was Savoy Net, I think 2012. The way he just looked at Alexis was like, Alexis? <laughs> I, got such, I got such a kick out of that. That was my very, very favourite thing. Madam, I trust you are in the enjoyment of good health. Sir, you are vastly polite. I protest I am much too well. <laughs> you are vastly polite. I trust you are in the enjoyment of good health. I will never get tired of how amazing this scene is and the rest it which follows it. Like this little section in The Sorcerer. But I have seen it messed up. I have seen people not appreciate this scene's brilliance. And just please just do it. Just appreciate it because it is really, really good. But the best scene in The Sorcerer with 144 points is the pre-quintet. I talked about this so much in my Sorcerer Dialogue video, so I don't really need to mention it again, but oh my goodness, have a look at that scene. Joke after joke, especially Dr. Daly's lines. As beauty will fade, but personal hygiene is something that can be <laughs> rectified whenever it suffers symptoms of decay. It's, it's just such a stupid thing for a person to say. But it is true, and the characters mean it, and they are actually, this is their way of communicating. And that just makes me giggle so, so much. So as we've seen, the sorcerer, no scene did really spectacularly well. Like, loads of yeoman scenes did better than the best scene in the sorcerer. However, it, sorcerer scenes are just more consistently good than yeoman scenes. That's just got a couple of duds in it. But Sorcerer is just very consistent, very skillfully written. Number six, we have Iolanthe. One that I am maybe surprised it didn't do possibly one better than this, but actually looking at it, you know, it, it does actually make sense. The trouble with Iolanthe is that although it is again like the Sorcerer, it is consistently very good. There are just a number of scenes which I find that don't really get across the characters very well. I particularly notice this with Strephon. I find that his first scene with Phyllis, I just feel he seems like mean to her. And like th these, you are we are supposed to be liking these characters, and it gives the audience, I think, quite a difficult time. Because I've never heard anyone else express this difficulty. Like, it's only really me that seems to have this problem, but. I do find that although they are funny, I find that Gilbert here, sometimes in Iolanthe, he puts comedy above realism or truth when it comes to character. And there are many, many, many instances in which he has managed to create fantastic characters that are extremely funny. So I'm not saying that every character has to be like as complex as the characters of some playwrights, I'm just comparing Gilbert to himself. And I do think that occasionally he's let himself down in a couple of these scenes. 41 points is the lowest score anything from Iolanthe got. And that's just, that was the Strephon and Iolanthe scene. It actually did way better than the Alexis and Aline scene. And also the scene with Captain Josephine and Joseph. So for a short scene, it actually did pretty well, but it is just a short scene. Iolanthe does have the best worst scene. It's got the highest ranked worst scene of all of them. Worst, according to my opinion. I shouldn't have to keep making that clear, but you know, I'm gonna. And then we have some kind of meh, meh ones, but then we do have a series of fantastic ones. So with 143 points, we have the Phyllis Talola and Mountarat scene, which I think in my video about Ilanthi, I did express that I had some difficulty with the characters in this one, but I did it again and I actually found it a bit better. 
I have found that when I've directed this, I've directed Island through three times before Bear Theatre, and every time I've done it, I've really tried not to just go down a route of making them gay or bisexual, you know, attracted to each other. Because I find I'm just so nervous about people laughing at LGBTQ characters on stage because they are LGBTQ. I, I, so I can't stand it in a way when you see in the video, like Talala kind of go closer to Montero and people laugh. It's like, would you be doing that if that was a heterosexual couple? And so I don't like to put my actors in that situation. I don't really like to kind of show LGBTQ people in that in those situations but I did honestly find it genuinely difficult to not read this scene with the characters being attracted to each other but I think there is a way of doing it and I'm getting closer to that but it is I do find it tough. With 160 points I have given the second scene of Strephon and Phyllis so here you see the characters are actually being ostensibly like a little bit mean to each other but it's very consistent with the characters that they've been ascribed throughout the opera at this point. You can see why they're behaving like that. Phyllis didn't listen to what Strephon had to say when he went, hear me Phyllis, because as far as we know, he was about to just say, look, sh she's a fairy, that's what it is. But at the same time, he could have just shouted out, she's a fairy, but then I guess everyone would have heard. So I do slightly blame Phyllis more, but I also think, Strephon, why didn't you just tell Phyllis? you were half a fairy. I suppose he was worried she wouldn't like him, but then surely you should be trusting each other a bit more. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe they didn't have that trust, but then the events of this story meant they did form that bond and she did apologize. So I think that the two of them do work it out. And actually what's cool about that is that it might make that first scene with them make a bit more sense because maybe these are just really immature characters, but you mustn't make them unlikable. Like, why would you do that? Please don't do that. I like seeing them nice, just immature. It's possible to make characters immature and just like showing them making bad decisions, but also show that they have really warm, good hearts at the same time. Then with 162 points, we have my favourite scene in Ireland, which is the Lord Chancellor and Strephon. Oh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful scene. Are you the Lord Chancellor of Thunderclouds and this and this and that, whatever it is. It's been a long time since I've done that video. He's like, no, no, I can't say I've ever met that point before. <laughs> just, just. When I went to New York, me and Will were like reading this scene for fun. And because it hadn't occurred to me that that pause being really long could be funny. And we were just reading this scene and Will was just eating an ice cream like, No, <laughs> I was like, the pause should be that long. I, that, I, would, I would like that. In fifth place, we have another opera that while it didn't have really any scenes in it that was spectacularly good, in fact, its top mark was 133. And so that would put its top scene in 46th place. So how has this managed to come number five? Well, it has because there's not a single bad scene in it. Like every single scene of this opera is actually kind of perfect. And one got 32 points, which is, so this is Pirates of Penzance, by the way. One got 32 points, which is the Edith, Kate and Isabel scene when they're taking off their stockings and paddling. But to be honest, I laugh at every line in that scene and it is a perfect scene. The only reason it did so badly compared to some of the others on this list is because we are ranking it against some scenes that have proper character development, proper like emotional stuff in it. But much like we can't really rank Trial by Jory like we rank the others, there's almost this sense to me in which the dialogue in Pirates just should be not in this list because it is perfect. The dialogue in Pirates of Penzance could not be any more perfect than it is. It is just so good. The next one after that gets 89 points. So it, it, there's, there's really not a single bad scene in this opera. The best scene with 133 points is the scene with Mabel and the policeman, which 
I, again, to me, it's just an absolute masterpiece in comedy. Like, that's the reason that most of these scenes did well from Pirates of Penzance. They all just got a huge comedy mark. And Pirates of Penzance is, in a way, I think, just my absolute favourite one when it comes to just, like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> like, just sheer joyous comedy. This is perplexing. We cannot understand it at all. Still, as he is actuated by a sense of duty, that makes a difference, of course. At the same time, we repeat, we cannot understand it at all. No matter. Our course is clear. We must do our best to capture these pirates alone. It is most distressing to us to be the agents whereby our erring fellow creatures are deprived of that liberty which is so dear to us all. But we should have thought of that before we joined the force. We should. Too late now. It is. To me that. It's too late now. <laughs> It's, just, it's one of my favourite moments in the whole canon. And as Mabel just doing this is just cracking. I, I absolutely love this scene as Mabel, but I actually slightly prefer the second half of it. I think it, it, it's, it's just genius. And the scene with Ruth and Frederick and the Pirate King. Oh my God, guys, like what a dramatic moment, but also how utterly hilarious. General Stanley is no orphan. What? More than that, he never was one. <laughs> Pirates is just so utterly perfect. And it is because the characters are so earnest. It's because they just completely believe in what they are saying. But the thing is, also Pirates is one of those ones that I consider to be quite director proof and actor proof. In that no matter how badly it's performed, people are still going to laugh at it. Because the material is just that funny. And that does make it pretty special. But it only came number five for me, Pirates, because even though I just love it so much and I get such joy out of it, I just feel that the four operas above it are just more skillfully written. The next one above it was a full five points ahead, and I do think it deserved that placement. So number four, I have given to one that surprised me. I thought this one was going to end up maybe below Pirates and Ireland, even maybe below The Sorcerer. But this one is The Grand Duke. If you haven't yet, please do watch my Grand Duke dialogue video where I go into more details about how amazing this is. So we do have some scenes which are not so good. With 33 points in 147th place, we have the pre sausage roll scene, which is basically just the first scene of the opera. But again, it's not a bad scene. You actually get a lot of narrative across. You get to learn like a little bit about Ludwig, not much. You get to learn what's going on. The notary comes in, there's fun chaos. Loads of people get a turn to speak. There's some emotion there. We learn about the Grand Duke. Like it's a good scene. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it at all. And then with 36 points, we get this is the only scene that I kind of think, mm -mm, maybe this could have been better. The Prince Ludwig and Bride scene. This is, I believe, the penultimate scene. And getting 63 points, which is, you know, on the low side. 117th place. I have Rudolf Chamberlain's and the Baroness. It's just a bit too busy. There's like a lot going on to keep up with. There's stuff in there that I don't think is necessary. I think it's just quite narratively weak. I think there is so much stuff to take in that I'm not really sure what should be taken in. I think that scene is a candidate for just cutting out the bit about the opera glasses and the houses on the square. Not because it's bad, just because it's not necessary. And I think that unlike other scenes in the kind of way you could have get away with extraneous information, that there's just way too much information in this scene. I just want to bring up, though, that there is a scene that you would think, wouldn't you, that if we were considering monologues, like how good each individual, these monologues are, Despard would probably win for me, but the thing is, that's just included in the scene that follows it, so I've not counted that as a monologue. You'd think, wouldn't you, that maybe the soprano from Mikado would have won that? But in fact, my favourite monologue 
in the entire Gilbert and Sullivan canon is Rufus monologue after the Baroness exits. And I know that's nuts. It got 60th place. So that is the highest mark that any monologue got. It got 120 points. But I genuinely think that this scene is absolute comic gold. And it's really emotional. And it gets across the character of Rudolph really, really well. Now for my detective's report. What's this? Another conspiracy. A conspiracy to depose me. And my private detective was so convulsed with laughter at the notion of a conspirator selecting him for a confidant that he was physically unable to arrest the malefactor. Why, it'll come off. This comes of engaging a detective with a keen sense of the ridiculous. <laughs> this comes of engaging a detective with a keen sense of the ridiculous. <laughs> I think that is funnier than what The Soprano and Mikado says. I'm sorry, like, come at me for that if you want. But I think that is hilarious. And then, yeah, the whole, I think I'm going to be ill. Oh, what's wrong with me? And it's, it's good. It's a really great monologue. So that's just really, really strong. So let's look at some of the scenes that did really, really well. So with 146 points, we get... Ludwig, Julia and the Baroness. This is so cracking, this one. The Baroness is just so fabulous. Oh, my darling, you're doing admirably and you'll improve with practice. It's so difficult being a lady when one isn't born to it. Am I to stand this? Am I not to be allowed to ball her to pieces? It's just so full of character. And you see Julia just breaking, like you see her finally get what's coming to her in a way that's both cathartic for like people who were not liking Julia, like ever since you know she appeared, basically. It's cathartic to the audience, but also she then quickly humanizes herself as well. So this whole section here is just so powerful. It's a, and it, it just perfectly precedes Julia's aria. The only thing that can make Julia vulnerable is by being confronted by a person who's kind of like her. And that, that, that's, that's very powerful. She kind of learns empathy. It's awesome. With 156 points, so doing really, really well, 23rd place is the quintet section. Just again with that Julia's line about the sh uh, shrivel your, his trusting nature into raisins. Oh, it's so fantastic. And Gentlemen, you don't seem to understand that this man ate three sausage rolls. Three large sausage rolls. Plenty of people eat sausage rolls who are not conspirators. Well, then they shouldn't. It's bad form. In 14th place overall, we get the Rudolph and Ludwig scene. What a darling scene this is. Now for my confession and full pardon. Wow, I'm really sweaty. Look at that. You wouldn't think it was winter, would you? I mean, I am in Italy, but I also, I also have an owl. Anyway... Now for my confession and full pardon. <laughs> I hear the Grand Duke was dancing duets in the marketplace, but I don't see him. Hello, this is the Grand Duke. <laughs> That's just so stupid. How do you deliver that line as an actor? Your only choice is to just make Ludwig like absolutely absurd. And the thing is, some people are absurd. Like, I'm quite an absurd person myself. And what's so interesting is I'm I'm currently playing the ghost of Christmas present, who is typically kind of quite like a big guy, you know, wearing like a big fur coat. I'm going to include like a picture of me as the ghost of Christmas present here. But um, I'm kind of playing it very much like non-binary. So I'm quite feminine in some places, quite masculine in others. I'm just myself, basically. It really kind of led me to believe like, wow, like this is actually who I am. I'm actually just playing myself in, in this scene. <laughs> And is, is that weird? Is it weird that I'm like, but your nephew Fred recognises how to enjoy life and his happiness brings warmth even on the coldest day. You know, like that is actually kind of what I'm like. That is kind of my authentic self. But the trouble is when you have autism or you're otherwise neurodivergent, you're kind of told, oh no, you're too much. Like, stop it. You're being fake. So when people just tell you your whole life that your authentic self is fake, it, it's it's so damaging, honestly. It's it's like being, t you're always told be yourself. But when I am myself, I said, like, no, no, that, that, that's, that's not real. 
nobody could be like that. No, 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 I am. So that is kind of what a lot of these characters are like. The characters in GNS in general, but especially the characters in the Grand Duke, I really do think it helps you to play them if you are neurodivergent, like genuinely. I think it helps you just click into that like very kind of stylistic way of acting because it might seem like, oh, you're just doing something weird for the stage, but no, like, because I am quite jerky in my movements. Like I have tics and I have like wide eyes and I have weird things that I do. I say weird, but they're wonderful things that I do. So for people to kind of say, oh, these characters can't be real, they're too like crazy and zany. Well, stop it. <laughs> because a lot of us are kind of like that. And... <laughs> Like, and the Baroness is so fabulous. Who wouldn't want to be the Baroness? It's like, yeah, she's a bit mean, but oh my God. I, I, if, if anyone was like that in real life, I would probably think, yeah, you're probably not very nice, but oh my God, you are utterly fabulous. Like Corella Deville. It's like, yeah, apart from the whole murdering puppies thing. Oh, she, she is fabulous. Like, if anyone's seen that film, Corella. Ugh. Anyway, this is just me trying to say that don't be surprised that the Grand Duke dialogue came so high. It really is superb and so funny, but it's just, it does have this kind of avant-gardeness that I do think a lot of people don't connect with, but me and loads of other people that I've talked to about the Grand Duke and just people who have started to warm up to the Grand Duke, they tend to agree that it's just, it's, it's, it's good. Grand Duke is good. Number three, I have given to Rudigore. While there are some scenes in this opera which have done extraordinarily well, there are also some that really haven't at all. So we have in the 163rd place, the second scene with Robin and Gideon. It's just so short and it's just kind of a bit of a nothing scene. Then with only 21, points we have the other scene with Robin and Gideon Krull. I just find Gideon Krull's character extremely confusing like I'm not really sure at all what Gilbert was trying to do with that character I think it's just done for comic effect and I, I just I don't really get it to be honest and then with only 28 points so there's three scenes that haven't really done too well is Dame Hannah and the girls at the start there's nothing wrong with this scene. I actually think it does do exposition pretty well. There's just a sense in which the bridesmaids' lines are just rather clunky, in my opinion. I, I don't think they flow as well as a lot of the expositional scenes in later operas, or indeed ones we've already talked about. But this, I do, I do find it's a bit of a clunky scene. I think it, it doesn't, doesn't have a lot of it's not easy to deliver. I play Dame Hannah, I play Zora, and I do not find this an easy scene to deliver, but it, is, it does have some emotion and dramatic impact in it. It's just, it's, it's just not really funny. Apart from the, to an eternal maidenhood, uh, that's quite good. But then, okay, so let's have a look at the scenes that have done really well. In fact, I can tell you right now that two scenes have made it into the top 10 but also number 12 so with 167 points is a scene with robin and the ghosts which is again just an absolute masterpiece of combining the dramatic and the ridiculous and it has this effect of being yeah, actually quite moving in places but also being some of the funniest jokes in the canon robin trying to get his way out of this situation by like trying to employ logic <laughs> to these ghosts and they're actually thinking about it. oh there's something in that fallacy somewhere i fancy <laughs> uh, it, and the way roderick talks we are foggy but we do not wish our fogginess to be presumed upon <laughs> it's it's just utterly absurd and it's so dramatic and i love the fact that all these ghosts have lines and it's it seems reasonable at first sight it does fallacy somewhere i fancy there's just so much going on it's so spine tingling the way Robin has all these voices around him and he's just trying to desperately get out of the situation it is just absolute comic gold I adore this scene but my two favorite scenes in the opera with 174 points so in fifth place overall we have the Rose and Mad Margaret scene which remains probably one of my favorite 
scenes to do at an audition. This is just such a great way of getting across Margaret's character. And it's so funny, but it's also really tragic. Again, it's just combining the humorous and the tragic, much like Jack Point talks about in The Omen of the God. But then my favourite scene in Red Gore, in fourth place, with 175 points, is a scene with Dick Dauntless and Despard. It starts off with Despard's incredible, spine-tingling and hilarious monologue, and then goes in to the scene where he learns that his brother faked his own death 20 years ago. And then and he, you get to see him go through so many emotions, as I've already talked about, or I will talk about. There's a scene where I talk about the characters and Dan takes us through the emotional journey of Despard in that scene. But this, what a cracking scene. Absolutely love the dialogue in Redigal. I think the only reason it didn't come higher is because the two above it are just a bit more consistent. So in second place, we have Patience. Now, Patience is one that does have a couple of dud scenes, actually, with five points. And in 175th place, we have Bunthorn and Patience in Act Two. This is another of those scenes that there really weren't many scenes in the canon that I actively didn't like. In fact, there are only seven scenes that I do not like in the canon, and this is one of them. I just find... It's so confusing, Patience's about turn. I know that these characters are living in this universe where love, to be true, has to be unselfish. But then she seems happy, but she wouldn't be happy about not being with Bunthorn because he's now nice. I, it, I don't understand it because she still doesn't like Bunthorn, which is why she's presumably happy about it, but then is she happy about it? Maybe she's not happy about it. I don't really understand her motivation here. I, I find Patience is Act 2, like end of Act 2, extremely confusing, and it kind of not ruins the character of Patience for me. I'd love to play Patience any day of the week, but I do find that this is not a satisfying ending for her, and it's confusing, and I just do not like this conversation they have. I think it is weird and it lets the rest of patients down. Also with 16 points, I've given the pre-act two finale. Again, it's just all because I, just, I can't stand what happens to patients as a character. I, I, it makes logical sense, but it means that everything she said in Love as a Plaintive Song is true. And that's not very nice, but it also means that she gets to be with Grosvenor, who is actually a nice guy, but she's only with him because she knows that he's not beautiful anymore. And it also cheapens their love because the idea that he would make himself less beautiful to be with her. And they're just like, go, I'll never set eyes on you again. What, because he's not as fit as he was, Patience? Like, wh what, what is this about? What are you doing? Who are you? But honestly, apart from those two scenes, Patience is consistently extremely good. We have three scenes in the top 10 scenes in the GNS operas. In 10th place, we have Grosvenor and the Maidens. This is when Grosvenor reads his poetry to the Maidens. And it is one of my favorite things in the canon. The two poems are so awful, but the Maidens react to them as if they're the same as Bunthorne's poems just proving that, that they have no idea what any of this is about, that they, they do they do not see a difference between Grosvenor's poetry and Bunthorne's poetry. It's just, it's what I feel like when, when I do what's called a castle tour, which is when the company that I'm part of, we take Shakespeare shows to castles in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Scandinavian countries, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. So we go all around in the summer. I, I've probably done my last one because it involves a lot of heavy lifting, but uh, I've done quite a lot of them. And um, what's really interesting is you get to rub shoulders with so many people that are very high up in society, very, very upper class people. And 
some of them have been absolutely lovely and I've really loved meeting people and kind of talking to them and kind of getting that getting into that perspective but like there's something that you you learn that like very rich people they actually love actors because no matter how rich you are or how powerful you are you cannot buy creativity like that that's something that you can't just pay money and get so to meet people who are literally like living out of rucksacks and dragging everything across Europe and performing in the pouring rain and like getting dirty, muddy, barely sleeping, like traveling around in a van, like troubadours, like that fascinates them. Like they love it. They absolutely love it. A lot of the people we come across like really do recognize like talent, but there are certainly kind of some places where we go where even if we've had like a really bad day, they're like, wow, that was amazing. And you're like, oh my God, like th th these people actually just don't, th they don't know. It is interesting to me how you, f you find that when it comes to people who are not in the creative industry, they're not usually able to discern sometimes between good people and extremely good people. Like, and I, I, and I can use my, I can use myself as an example. Some people will hear me sing opera or attempt to sing opera and say to me, "Wow, Rachel, y why are you not on stage at the Royal Opera House?" I'm like, "Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm really not nearly as good as, <laughs> as you think I am." But I think there are some people that honestly can't tell the difference. And, I th and that is, so that is a genuine thing that happens. And because it's true, it's hilarious. And especially because it's really rich people, like in this opera, like these rapturous maidens are all kind of society ladies. They're all very, very posh, well-to-do ladies. So it's very fun to see them kind of taken in. But Grosvenor isn't taking them in. Grosvenor genuinely believes he's really good. Grosvenor is just a bit, bless him, he's not very good. But he, he really, truly believes in his craft and thinks he's very good. And the fact that the maidens just don't really get that he's not that good is so funny. So this scene, absolutely pure comedy gold. And then with 170 points in Act 2, Patience, Grove and a Bunthorn Jane, that whole section that precedes love is a plaintive song. I mean, talk about comedy, emotion, dramatic stakes. Like, it has everything. And this is why it's such a shame that Patience's character kind of gets a bit destroyed later in the opera. But I adore this scene. It's so pure and perfect and so well crafted as a dramatic scene. But my favourite scene from Patience, which came third place out of all of these operas, is Patience and Grosvenor in Act One, when they meet again after Pretty Pretty Maiden. I had the best time doing this with Will back in 2018 with Savoy Net. I think that Grosvenor probably has more funny lines than Patience does, but the thing about acting is that often you're setting up people, and that's okay. Like, it's up to you to be kind of generous and recognise that, okay, maybe this moment isn't about me, but I can adapt my speech and physicalise my words in order to make the other person's lines land as quickly as possible. And there are some really funny moments of patience in it as well. But honestly, this scene, it's so pure, it's so loving. These two genuinely are so happy to see each other. And the reason they can't be together is so silly, but they really believe it. And Grover, oh, oh, I never thought of that, a oh, fatal perfection. Again, you come between me and my happiness. <laughs> But stay, yes, Patience, I may not love you, for you are perfection. There's nothing to prevent your loving me. I'm plain, homely, unattractive. Why, that's true. <laughs> it's, it's, he's not meaning to be mean to her. It's just a fact, and she doesn't take offence to it. It's, it's, just, it's just facts. And it's just so pure. It's just, it makes me so happy. That scene, truly one of the finest things that Gilbert ever wrote. But, of course, in first place, which will not come as a surprise to anybody at all, which ended a full 13 points ahead of Patience, one scene did only get 11 points. And that scene is the Patagai's monologue. But it's just tiny and it's an afterthought. But every other scene, we have some that got fewer than 100 points, but generally, there are so many 
utterly cracking scenes in this. Let me just go through the ones that got in the top 10, which are four scenes, four scenes got into the top 10 of the overall scenes in these operas. The tenor and soprano love scene, which is utterly iconic in so many ways, so quotable, with our arms around each other's waists, like that. Breathing sighs of unutterable love, ah, like that. And it's just so quick, so, so earnest. And I do, I do love the 1966 version of this. It's just so beautiful. There, I was certain of it directly. I heard you play. Valerie Masterson, the way she delivers those lines. It's an absolute masterclass. I did a masterclass with Valerie Masterson once. She's great. I really, really love her. And she taught me a lot even though we spoke about the song I sang for five minutes. So thank you, Valerie Matheson. And she is still my favorite soprano in Mikado that there's ever been. She's just so perfect and beautiful and serene and graceful and gentle, but also with just this impeccable comic timing. It just shows that you can be so funny in this role without losing any likability. Like you don't have to be all like, there, I was settled over directly, I heard you play it. In seventh place, we have the scene that immediately precedes I am so proud. It contains that line, not half so awkward as a man engaged in the act of cutting off his own head or something to that effect. I love that line. It's just the fact that the baritones are just so casually telling the patter guy, like, yeah, I think it has to be you, I'm afraid. <laughs> It's just so matter of fact. But the patter guy's like, well, no, wait, <laughs> wait, wait. And I actually think that the little this song should go like in the middle of this scene. It gives the song some stakes. In sixth place, which I'd forgotten about, so we actually have five out of the top 10 scenes are from the Mikado, is the Mikado, alto and trio scene. <laughs> there should be, of course. Yes, but there isn't. Uh. Yes, we can wait until then. <laughs> I don't want any lunch. Just one of the most perfect scenes that's ever been written. Like, I don't really see how you could mess this up. This is pretty director proof. I would laugh, however, this was delivered. Like, th th this, this scene, the way the narrative progresses, the way they kind of get to the next part of the story using this scene, but also in a way that is just screamingly funny from start to finish. It is a, a work of genius on Gilbert's part. Then in second place, we have that really chaotic scene in act two where they realize the Mikado is on his way and he'll be here in 10 minutes. And um, the patter man says, oh, soprano, soprano, bother the soprano. <laughs> you take her and marry her and never come back again. It's like, <laughs> A close thing that for here he comes. It's just like slapstick genius. It's it's so good, and also the patter guy's like total breakdown in in the middle of the scene. Then having to reform his character with what he now realizes to be true about himself. That I'm like, but no, I I I don't. I'm not ready. I'm going to take lessons. I mean to start with a guinea pig and then work my way through the animal kingdom until I get to a second trombone. I, 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 I can't kill you. I, I can't kill anyone. And that's the moment he realises that he's dead. There's nothing he can do. I can't kill you. I can't kill anyone. Not even to save his own life. He can't kill a person even to save his own life. Even to a person who's like, behead me. He can't do it. But then suddenly, in that moment of realisation, he gets an idea. Actually, I don't think that is the case. Tenor, take the soprano, and, and, then, and then you get the absolute classic, like, soprano, are you, are you particularly busy? Not particularly. <laughs> so low stakes. Not particularly. <laughs> but if I'm to be buried alive, no. <laughs> There was this just, there's only one scene in the, in the entire canon that I think is better than this one, and that is the one that got first place, which is the one between the patter guy and the tenor. Again, this 
the ludicrousness of the fact that the patter guy begins kind of thinking, oh God, that's horrible. No, I, I, I don't want to see you die in front of me. Or like, oh, no, I don't want to see that at all. It's like less empathy and I think more like, oh, that's gross. I don't know. I guess you can play it any way you want. But when he realises, oh, wait, oh no, I can use this guy as a substitute. He inadvertently says something that actually makes the tenor kind of almost change his mind. So he says, well, you know, the soprano will be distracted. And he goes, well, I, I wouldn't want the soprano to be upset by my death. Perhaps if I were to withdraw for Europe for a couple of months, you know, I may contrive to forget her. And then suddenly the patter guy's like, whoa, no, no. And then he has to convince him to kid himself after all. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just horrifying. It's like, oh my God. You were actually convincing a guy that the best thing to do is end his own life. That, that is the stage <laughs> that he's got to in his desperation. Like, oh no, I mean, life without the soprano. I mean, oh no, it's... Uh, and then... Like my, and then my favourite line, like one of my favourite lines in the whole canon. I know I love the Ray Flower with Josephine, but that's just through its sheer brilliant writing. The funniest line in the canon to me, like the, the, the funniest just quick response is when, is in response to when the patter guy says, oh, I mean, you know, life without the soprano, it, it seems absurd. Yet there are a good many people who have to endure it. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's so true. Like, yeah, <laughs> actually, that is really sensible. It's just the fact that the tenor is just so, like, apparently low stakes, but it's it's actually kind of like, relatable and believable. And that contrasted with the patter guy's utter panic and anxiety is just perfect. And then when the tenor realises he can use the situation to his advantage, suddenly the scene becomes a bit different. It's like, oh, well, I will... Well, let me marry the soprano, and then in a month you can behead me. It's, oh, yeah, but my, my position over the next month will be really quite awkward. I'm not half as awkward as my position at the end of it. <laughs> it's, it's so matter of fact, and this is just absolutely mind blowing how funny this scene is. One of my absolute favourite things in the canon. Probably my fa one of my favourite moments in the canon. Definitely my favourite scene in the canon. Mikado, I think, was definitely going to win this for me. I mean, even if I hadn't included that Patagai scene, five of the top ten scenes were scenes from the Mikado, and I think that is 100% deserved. I genuinely think it is. The dialogue in the Mikado is just a level above anything else. Like, even of a Patience and Radigal. Because while those two have excellently crafted scenes. You know, Patience does have, I think, that weakness at the end of it. And I do think that there are just a few scenes in Radical that maybe just aren't very well thought through. But Mikado, it's like every scene in it is just so perfect for what it is. And, you know, even a bit like Pirates, really. But it's also so clever, so funny, so emotional, so full of character that it very much deserves its top spot in this list. So that is my dialogue scenes rankings. I hope that you guys agree. I don't think this would have come as a surprise to people after how much I was going on about the Mikado in my Mikado dialogue video, but I hope that you agree with the rest of my list. Let me know if you don't let me, let me know if you think things should have been switched around. As I say, I was actually surprised that Yeoman and Gondoliers beat Utopia because I thought Utopia style was pretty good but I think there's enough joy in Gondoliers and enough character in Yeoman especially with Phoebe and Wilfred that I do think those two belonged above it um I do think Ida deserves to be quite low down let me know if you agree with that but otherwise just yeah engage with me in the comments as I say I, I love criticism when it's constructive so please do chip in join a conversation and join me next time with or without the owl hat which I'm gonna put on right now and go to dinner in Verona so bye bye for now and I will speak to you through this format very very soon indeed please subscribe goodbye <laughs>